Welcome to this edition of Wine Women Awards. Joining us, as always, is Michelle. Hello. And our uh, wonderful guest this evening is Jasmine Iolani Hakes, and we're here to talk about her book, Hula. So thank you so much for joining us. All right. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So for those who are not familiar with the novel, could you give us a little bit of a synopsis? Basically, it's a love letter to my hometown of Hilo on the big island of Hawaii. It's... The simple version of the plot is it's a girl who looks white, comes from a prominent Hawaiian family and wants to become a hula dancer and turns out that she's hanaid, which is the Hawaiian version of adopted. And so it goes into all of the implications of what that might mean and, and the history of why that matters. Mm. Um, I'm still fair, fairly... Um... No, I won't say early on in the book, but I'm not quite at the halfway mark. So, but I've been enjoying this book so much. It's so lyrical. And one of the things that really stood out to me is uh, the narration of the story, given the fact that it's in third person, which the third person point of view, for most readers, that's not something that's like stand out, you know, uncommon. But the way you do it, where you've got this other the narration it comes to life and it feels like it makes hawaii seem like the very much a character so much more so than like in the settings i know we always and i'm i know i'm ranting here but i know we always talk about you know the settings being the character but that element of the collective we in this narration just really just element elevates that to such a high degree and so i'm fangirling over for a moment over that with you. I, 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 people have called it the royal we which sounds very fancy to me it sounds like i know what i'm doing uh but you know honestly that voice came first and it it very much you hit the nail on the head uh it's very much that voice of hilo that the town you know my hometown and it was the the way I could communicate what our community feels like in its rhythm, you know, and and so it's kind of to me it was it was a mix of, you know, in early iterations people would ask like who are these people? Can you articulate? You know, can I get visuals on them? And and I it's kind of it was a people current people, but it was also ancestors and it was it was the Aina, it was the land itself, it was you know it was mythology it was gods and goddesses it was memories it was you know all these different things and and hawaiians native hawaiians sovereignty fighters activists non-locals you know all of the that have moved there and um and yeah once that voice came out the rest of the book just kind of exploded out of me that that really it was so freeing i had never seen that on paper like the sound of my home you know the way we talk and and the way our sense of humor and and uh, the our cultural coding you know and so thank you I appreciate I appreciate <laughs> being appreciated <laughs> yes I got a text from Diana uh with just it was just a picture of the book and then right underneath it, she, it was, oh my gosh, this book is so beautiful. <laughs> I appreciate it. I I was worried, you know, it is such a beautiful cover and I was worried that people might feel kind of, um, you know, it's a very serious, heavy book. There's a lot of heaviness in it. Um, you know, it deals with the overthrow of the kingdom and, and a lot of, uh, racist laws and and just kind of it puts into context the the tension between locals and 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 hawaiians and and hawaiians and everybody else and and so i, I worried that people would just either not pick it up because they didn't think it was going to be a substantive read or pick it up and be kind of surprised it wasn't a light summer fun thing but so far yeah i've heard you know people are pretty receptive to it so i appreciate that i appreciate people giving it a chance and I feel like the writing kind of helps 
transcend that as somebody who's visited Hawaii and has taken some time to try to study at least some of the history to be able to you know appreciate the culture that's there and not just be one of those bumbling tourists that you're like oh my god did they really just do that like <laughs> I've come across some of them on my travels in other countries and I've that's when I made a point not to be those people yeah. and I feel like reading the book also feels like being in Hawaii it feels like you were talking about it being the voice of Hilo and it very much feels that way when you're reading it that's what I was hoping. I was hoping, I mean, because yeah, you know, th that was the hard thing for me. I had island fever growing up and I wanted to travel, but I, I was horrified at the idea that I would be a tourist anywhere else, you know? <laughs> so I was like, okay, well then I can't do that, you know? But I think what I, what I envisioned, well, what I hoped, my ultimate goal was I had this kind of notion of if you're traveling, say in Europe or something, and you're going to France and you're hitting all the Eiffel Tower and you're doing all of that and it's fun and it's great and you you eat your croissant and you have your you know your cappuccino at the Amelie Cafe and it's wonderful and you go home and you have pictures and it's nice that's a very different experience than you get off the plane in Paris and some local family says hey come come to our house and you stay in a bedroom and you're kind of listening to them at the dinner table and you don't understand everything that's going on but you you kind of can put together maybe 70, 80% of it, and you're just kind of there observing, you go home and that's kind of a transformative experience. Very yeah. different, you know? And I thought people have had the first version of that for Hawaii, but not so much the second. And you might not ever get privy mm -hmm. to that kind of experience. So that's also why kind of there was no glossary, which was very polarizing and continues to be a point of discussion um but it was it was why I I thought I I will ask my reader to be okay with not perhaps not understanding every single thing that's being said or mm -hmm. hinted at or you know the 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 some sayings and and the usage of Hawaiian words or, or heavy pigeon you know I I just thought well maybe that hopefully will be part of your experience in it and orient you in that way of like, you're an outsider, but you're a guest. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I love that you brought up language because there, um, I forget the author's name, but he made this wonderful point where he was like, you know, in fantasy, you can create this whole Elvish language and use it and nobody bats an eye. And I put in a few damn Mexican words and everybody suddenly is all upset. And it really drove home the point of the fact that as readers, when we put in, when, we, when we're reading a novel, that it's got to have at least some, if it has other language in it, that other person's perspective. We're reading not just for ourselves, but to be experienced, other perspectives. And then there's another language in it then so be it. And it was one of those things when I was writing his Italian historical fiction and I put in Italian words, it was one of the things where I was like, I'm not putting in a glossary. It shouldn't be a part of the glossary. You you figure it out on your own if you absolutely need to know what that word is. You learn a little bit. Yeah. But you also, you know, like say you're back in Paris, mm -hmm. you know, you you don't have access to constantly looking up, yeah. you know, your Google translator or whatever it is and your, your dictionary. And you have to learn language the way we learn language, our first language, right? You mm -hmm. have to kind of read body language and get the, the context of it and gauge the situation and what they're, they're pointing to. And, and so, yeah, you know, it, I think we all, when you're writing, we all kind of have to, we have all these decisions to make on, on top of plot and character development and all these things, but we also have to decide, you know, how much we want our readers to work. And, mm -hmm. and I didn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily want to agonize people and antagonize, but I also, I thought, Hey, I'm, I'm not going to pander to you. I, I'm, I'm, you know, you have, you, you have plenty of opportunities to read just kind of, a breezy light story that that's fun and entertaining and that's that's not my goal here you know mm -hmm. I, I wanted you to feel like you'd come to my house and my house it's you know you're gonna get a lot 
It's a lot of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me think of everything that you just said makes me think of the difference between visiting someplace and immersing yourself in the place, the culture, the people, the language. And, and that kind of feels like, you know, what reading should be for, for readers is you're immersing yourself in something completely, like maybe it's, you know, depending on the book, it could be something you're very, very familiar with, and it feels very comfy and cozy. And sometimes it can feel new and you don't really know exactly what you're saying. You don't really know everything that's going on. And okay. That's part of the experience. Yeah. One of, one of the, the um, messages I got from many people uh, throughout the country uh, that were reading it from, from that outside perspective, uh, uh, you know, like the mainstream reader who wouldn't be familiar with all of these things, uh, they would, I would, they'd write in and they'd say, I, I love Hawaii. Like, is it okay if I still go, you know, like, I'm sorry, I, you know, how do I reconcile that? And, and I've kind of really thought about that, like how to answer, I, I can't give you the, you know, the stamp of approval or tell you not to go, but I have started like encouraging people to, to just say, you know, I don't want you to not go, but if you read this, and then you go, it will enhance your experience because what will happen is you're not just going to Hawaii and appreciating the natural beauty. You're going to a different place with a culture that's rich with history, with all kinds, with art, with, with you know, language and knowledge and, and a, pers a very unique perspective. And so you'll get so much more out of that, you know, and yeah, the, if you go somewhere and it's a destination, usually if I go to a destination, it's like Mexico and I'm going to go because I'm going to relax and I'm going to work on my tan and I'm going to catch up on my rest and I'm going to chill. You know, if I go to a place, if I go somewhere I've never been before and that it's I'm really kind of interested in its history and it's clearly foreign to me, I'm going to kind of read up on like, what should I see? What kind of things should I experience? What can I learn about this place? And so even just that simple paradigm shift of Hawaii being a place versus just a destination, I think can be a profound transformation in just kind of your positioning the moment you get off the airplane, you know, or the cruise ship or what have you, you know, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> no, no worries. I feel like that also, so there's this greater discussion, I think, in the travel world of, uh, responsible tourism there's mm -hmm. so many places in this in the world hawaii being one of them um i know uh venice is another where there's over tourism where mm -hmm. the tourism can wreak havoc on the havoc on the local communities in multiple ways and i think it's a matter of just making a point of being responsible yeah. about the tourism and and being that responsible tourist yeah i mean and i think more and more people are starting to get that i believe mm -hmm. that uh, the recently new appointed um, head of the Hawaii Tourism Board, there's now this huge emphasis on ecotourism and and just kind of like there's a there's a way to have balance. Mm -hmm. The problem wasn't people wanted to come and experience Hawaii. The problem was it something was out of balance. Yeah. You know, and and we need to write that. And there's examples of what that looks like now. It's not impossible. And it doesn't mean nobody can come or, and it doesn't mean, you know, we, we're going to shut down all the hotels and, you know, but there, I think there's a way to do it, all things in, a little more in balance with, with, with nature and, and with locals and, and just kind of everything, because honestly, we all, and when I say we, I, I mean, like even in Hawaii for a long time, we bought the whole, you know, tourism is our only economy and we benefit and without it we'd starve and what we've become a lot more aware of is that the hotels they underemploy locals and they don't bring a lot of benefit you know they they raise prices of real estate i mean so so there's problematic things that that have come with with it and that's yet another just shift in perspective of like there's an industry here that's not tourism, that's not hotels, and and that we can 
do both without completely compromising everything and swallowing everything and 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 just kind of accepting the what it is you know as the only way to move forward and it's not it's not the case mm -hmm. Now, given the fact that I am the historical fiction person here, we have to talk about the research because okay. every book, regardless of the genre, because I don't, I feel like Hula is considered literary. It doesn't, is it really, it's not really considered cons uh, historical fiction, is it? You know, it depends on who you ask. Now, I always thought it was literary. And, mm -hmm. and I would argue for, for other reasons that maybe we, if we have time, I'll get into, I, I, would, I would argue that it's current affairs. But, uh, you know, people have classified it as historical fiction, at least like on Amazon, but who knows what, what mm -hmm. algorithm that came out of, you mm -hmm. know, but I, 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 I don't know, want to, I don't know if you had a specific question that lead, lead into that, but it I never wanted to write historical fiction. I, I wanted to write a contemporary story about Hawaii that reflected my experience, you know, and my home in a way that I had not felt had been done and certainly not enough, you know, even of late. I, um, I realized fairly early on that you couldn't, yeah. you couldn't understand what the Napakas were facing you couldn't understand why there was a fight. You couldn't understand what was at stake without understanding the history. Now, mm -hmm. I wrote the very early iteration of the story with the plot being a girl who looks white and is a hula dancer that's very autobiographical. I look white and, and I was a hula dancer, but I'm not white. And, you know, so I'm a, this mix of things. I have this vagueness about me and and... So that was autobiographically inspired. So I wrote a majority of He'i's story, at least initially, from this very vulnerable place of just memories and and insecurities and dredging up all these old demons. And but I grew up alongside those protests and and that cultural revolution, but I didn't understand it. it you know, we didn't have history books back then to explain what was going on or why. And so even for me, I think, because my editor started asking like, well, why? And I was like, I don't know, just because, you know, and, and I had to kind of, so the history started building out and around the story of the Naupakas mm -hmm. and, and this, this journey of he to kind of figure out who she is or even, you know, what her place is within her family. And, um, and so it was an interesting process for me to, to have to step away from my own personal experience and to really go deep into the history of things and understand that what I thought was a very individual personal experience about me because of what I look like was not at all limited to just me. And there was a very clear, very big political historical context to what I had intuited as a child and what I, all those feelings that I had, there were explanations for all of it. And so, you know, so yeah, it was kind of, if it's, if people do classify it as historical fiction, that's completely on accident. I, I didn't set out to like counter Mishner, you know, or anything like that. I, I, I'm not a historian at all. I, I didn't know the history. I grew up only knowing, at least in school, only being taught the year Hawaii became a state. That was all they taught you. And I think that also goes towards one of the things I love about historical fiction genre itself. Like myself, uh, myself, I'm not a historian at all. I'm a hard. I consider myself an armchair historian at best. Ooh, I'm going to steal and, that. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I stole it from somebody else, so you can do it too. Go, we'll continue and run with it. But yeah. I also feel like um, historical fiction is really great with genre bending. Mm -hmm. as well so it can bleed into other genres and be a part of other genres because history informs so much of who we are both personally and culturally and societally yeah. or well i will say that societally is a word we'll go with that yeah. <laughs> it works it all works um because we're writers so we just can we can yep. make up words and do whatever we want Stay with enough confidence and it's true you exactly know. <laughs> <laughs> so for the research portion of this this book and the history that you get into, like I said earlier, um, 
I was aware of some of the history, but there was a lot more of the history that I was finding and like going down these rabbit holes on my phone, mm -hmm. uh, going through, you know, doing the whole Wikipedia search, like, oh, wow, this is really interesting, learning more and more about the history and what was happening. What was that research journey like for you? What did you do for it? It was, it was honestly, it was so transformative for me, but it also prompted all kinds of conversations with my family and with my, my community. I mean, it was a really, and I think those conversations are happening in Hawaii organically anyway, because my nieces and nephews are learning the history in a way that we never did. They have access to information that we never had. Like these books are new, you know, relatively new that, um, that, I, that I used as my research and put in my bibliography. And, and I even just put a bibliography in a novel because I, now we have a bookshelf full of history books about Hawaii that we didn't have before, you know, so even that was a novelty, but I think I had to approach it understanding that so much of Hawaiian history has been misconstrued or ignored or overlooked because of the simple fact of like how many years it took even to fight for the United States to acknowledge that they had a role in the overflow and overthrow and even them acknowledging that the kingdom was overthrown, you know? So, so I understood that I couldn't just go to history books. I couldn't just go to newspapers because most of the newspapers were written by mission. It was very skewed. It was a very skewed political perspective, you know? And so thankfully there were a lot of primary sources that I, that I relied on. I, I, um, and it, this history is not old enough to not have access to a lot of that, you know? So I, uh, I have asked uncles, I've asked aunties, I, you know, all the fight against Walmart or big box store, not Walmart, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, th th that was all true. Like the, the fight for the tarp at Puhi Bay, the Hawaiianologist, the salt, all of these stories, I didn't know, you know, so I actually started writing Hula, not knowing any of that and not even putting it really in there, but having kind of this framework. And then st I myself started learning what my own story was about, what I was trying to write, you know, and it started in a full day. I, and, and part of it was just kind of like, it happened in a very Hawaii way of, oh, well, you got to go call so-and-so. Oh, you want to know that you go call. And I would just follow any lead anybody was willing to give me. And I started ending up having these conversations with scholars and very well-respected, you know, uh, cultural activists, as well as like even the woman who, who at that time, I believe she was a staffer and who actually penned the draft of the apology bill. So she's telling me, you know, like, how where why she wrote this word and used this and this whereas and and then during covid i happened upon you know social media somehow you see something and there was a posting for a free history kind of um course and it was with a historian and a well-respected professor from U University of Hawaii at Manoa. And he works with Hawaii State Archives and things. And this was just for locals. And part of why, and it was free, and it was just this incredible thing. And part of the reason he was doing this and offering this was because so many of our elders, like my mom's generation and my grandma's generation, they were shamed for being who they were, you know, they were shamed for being brown and speaking pigeon and, and being, having a different kind of cultural um, value system, even of land and an understanding of an appreciation for, for what, what you were put on this earth to do and what you were supposed to be pursuing. And basically the education was you lost your kingdom because we had a king who was frivolous and a drunkard and and we saved you from yourselves and for generations that was that was basically the messaging and so what he started doing was putting together this whole coursework of like going through the kingdom's archives and showing us Kalakaua's journals and these these elaborate mathematical equations that he would do and and the letter that I allude to that Thurston wrote, I saw that letter. There's a, I have a, I have a PDF screenshot of it. And I started crying and, and these elders that I'm participating with are just sobbing because it's not about history to them. It was, it's changing your own relationship with yourself. Suddenly 
I'm lifting my my chin up a little higher and saying, you know, and I'm getting I'm getting goosebumps right now because it was like I, I some of these I would call my mom and just start crying and and you know and so there's this new, and so I think I benefited from this very unique time in Hawaiian history that that is that that that's available you know I wouldn't have been able to write this without that at least not with this kind of awareness and mm -hmm. and so yeah it, it it was pretty much it was it was a game changer for sure you know and now I I'm just I'm all in you know whatever I can learn <laughs> like the research never stopped you know <laughs> writing at a certain point you have to be done with the book but now I'm I'm just I I read and I experience anything I can get my hands on and it's and it's fascinating you know when it comes to history the the truth of stranger than fiction is so very very true yep. and i find that so much of our stories can be derived from little bits of history that nobody talks about or they want to just push under the rug it's like oh wait no no there's there's a story here there's something here to, that needs to be told yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sitting in Sacramento right now. I have a couple of book clubs and things that I'm, I'm doing up here and, um, and Sacramento itself. I mean, it's a good example of that. So my next book that I, that I'm supposed to be finishing, but like yesterday, um, <laughs> there's these 10 Hawaiians came with the man who kind of first established uh Sacramento Sutter John Sutter and these 10 Hawaiians came with him and they're basically the only reason he was given a land grant and and allowed to like survive and live and have this fort and there's evidence to suggest they were the first to find gold and started the gold rush and honestly if I wanted to write a, a, a non-fiction book about it it'd be impossible because People just went, oh, those are Sutter's Hawaiians. And that's it mm -hmm. because they were just brown islanders. Nobody cared. You know, they weren't the ones writing the history. And so I very much, as much as I'm not a historian now, I, I, my, that's my next book of bringing them to life using fiction in a, in a way to connect those dots in a way I can't otherwise because mm. it, it doesn't exist. You know, the, the paperwork at least doesn't exist. And again, this is why I love the historical fiction genre, because history just so overlooks women and people of color throughout history. It's it's the ones that had power. And traditionally in the world, it's been white men who have had the power. And so like there's so many like I, we had Lauren Willig on talking about women's and women in history. And she was actually a historian. She's got a, a, a history degree. And she had told us that there was so much about with it with women's history that we just don't know that yeah. historians, mm -hmm. the historical fiction is what's filling in the gaps because they just never bothered to write it down. And I love, I mean, that's why I love stories like hidden figures and the commercial success of those mm -hmm. just kind of, I think, prods us to go, okay, yeah. if, if you're interested in this, let me, let me tell you another story, you know? And so mm -hmm. I think, you know, I've been wanting to write this Sutter book for so long, but I was very discouraged because I was just like, who am I to think I can bring this to life? And, you know, and, and what can I do? But I think writing Hula really encouraged me to go, OK, well, there might not be books for this, but the stories exist. I just have to mm -hmm. find them. The stories mm -hmm. are alive somewhere in somebody's living room. Somebody's grandpa <laughs> is boring somebody to tears with the story they pretend to <laughs> I just haven't. So I got to find them, you know, and, and it's true. There's so much, so much. And it's not just, I think, a, a, an, an interest in history. It's, it does give us a better understanding of why, mm -hmm. where we are and how did we get here and why do I feel the things I feel? And I think that was, sorry, I'm going on this tangent, but, you know, I think that was why my story turned into not just a story about a girl wanting to dance hula but this multi-generational saga because I wanted to show the three generations of this family represent three very distinct different perspectives and and uh, opinions and ideas but part of it was the context they grew up in we all have historical and political context we have socioeconomic context and that changes over time and so our relationship with ourselves and our and and our 
our definition of things changes as well, you know? So yeah. So now I'm, now I'm, now I'll bore anybody to tears with it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you won't bore us. We, we love no, a good tangent. Absolutely not. I'm here for it. I will listen. Right, the right company. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I know we are at our half hour here, but we do have one last question. We like to ask everybody um, that is, what are you currently reading? What am I currently reading? Oh gosh, I am actually, so I, I, you know, like a lot of writers, I listened to the uh, New York times podcast, the book mm -hmm. review podcast, and they did, they kind of went down this rabbit hole of Stephen King. And it's kind of funny because I haven't read Stephen King since I was in high school, you know, cause now I read literary things and, you know, <laughs> and, um, and so one of the the guests on the podcast was talking about Duma Key and just raving about Duma Key and loved Duma Key so much. And I was like, I never read Duma Key. So I, I'm I'm both reading that and I'm reading The Great Divide, which is a new that a book that just came out. I got a copy just by chance because we share an agent and it's a fabulous book. So I, I'm reading two simultaneously, one old one and one brand new one. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very common for, for an author, I believe. And the great point is it's historical. Ones. So it, you might be interested in checking it out. It's a Ooh. really good book. Very cool. I will definitely have to check that out. I'm definitely not looking up to McKee right now. Absolutely not. <laughs> I know. It's, and it's so funny because it's like after so many decades of not reading Stephen King, you know, it's just like, oh man, this is so much fun. He's so, he's just, I don't know, to be in that man's head. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, genre of fiction for the longest time got a bad rap. If yeah. you had to be within the genre. And I've, I've even come across it when I was at a party once and somebody was like oh you're a writer what do you like to write and I was like I write historical I'm writing a historical fiction and they gave me this look of disgust yeah. like pure disgust like ew what are you doing here but the fact of the matter is is that it doesn't matter what you read and my quote that I love to say is it's a, read everything from the back of shampoo bottles to the classics because they all have something to say about society and culture and people. Yeah, I mean, and I think marketing departments still rely on genre for certain things, but I think readership, we've gotten a, a lot more flexibility in like literary fiction doesn't necessarily mean a quiet book and commercial fiction doesn't necessarily mean an uncomplicated plot. You know, like there's all these types mm -hmm. that we, we st like stuck to for so long. And now there's so much overlap that I think readers too are comfortable with kind of going in and out of sections of the book, the bookstore, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, you don't just go to one shelf or one case in the corner. You go to all of them. Okay. But everyone, if uh, you would like to get your own copy of Hula, be sure to check out our show notes and you can find the link to our bookshop on bookshop.org. As always, bookshop.org supports our incredible writers. Um, it supports the podcast, but most importantly, it supports all the wonderful indie bookstores out there. And uh, Jasmine, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with us. And I quick. know, thank you so much. <laughs> I know if I was could, I was pretty tonight. quiet tonight, but I, well, I, I just had so much talk. I just jab away. I think you got one question in. You know, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes those are the funnest interviews when you when we can just like listen, and I love it. I I love whenever that happens. Mm -hmm. well well thank you for flattering me yeah <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much have a wonderful rest of your night thank you, thank you. bye